The second uh, laureate that we have the pleasure uh, of having a visit with is the laureate for science, Professor Howard Chang. Professor Chang is an MD-PhD. Uh, he uh, is originally from Taiwan, but received his bachelor degree at Harvard, and then did a PhD in biology at MIT. Subsequently, he attended Harvard Medical School and then did a dermatology residency, and then postdoctoral training in Stanford. Uh, since then, he's joined the faculty at Stanford in 2004 and became tenured in 2008 and ascended to the rank of professor. Dr. Chang is being awarded or honored for his pioneering contributions in elucidating the role of long non coding uh, RNAs in gene regulation and function, as well as for the co development of innovative genome wide approaches for identifying DNA regulatory regions. These discoveries are having a powerful impact across molecular biology and genetics and have important implications for understanding complex uh, human diseases. Dr. Chang, if you could. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I hope you can all hear me. And I'm really delighted to be here and grateful for the honor of the King Faisal Prize in Science. Uh, today I want to tell you about this new area of gene regulation related to long non coding RNAs and tell you about really a story that connects science with medicine. The human immune system has a striking sex bias. And many of you know that uh, the large majority of our patients with autoimmune diseases are women, four out of five patients. That is an average. If you look at a relatively common disease like lupus, the ratio is nine to one, female to male. The disease like Sjogren's syndrome, the ratio is 19 to one, female to male. So as was mentioned, I'm a dermatologist, and these are some of the patients that I see. I always wondered about this. But really, this reflects a double-edged sword, because in other kinds of uh, immune diseases or situations, uh, the female sex is uh, potentially advantageous. So for example, in immunotherapy, response to melanoma, female patients do much better, as was the case with the recent COVID-19 infection. And when thinking about this problem in the past, people have thought about the possibility that maybe uh, there are differences in sex hormones. Obviously, men have more testosterone, women more estrogen. Uh, more recently, uh, we and others uh, thought about the difference in X chromosome dosage. Uh, and of course, uh, men have an X and a Y chromosome, and women have two X chromosomes. And indeed, individuals with an XXY genotype, so-called Kleinfelter syndrome, uh, are phenotypically male, but have female level risk of autoimmune disease. So that finding really suggests that it's something about the second X chromosome that is really important. But of course, there are hundreds of genes on the second X chromosome. So is it all those genes together? Is it one of them in particular? Uh, this was a mystery. But I want to tell you today about a series of discoveries that led us to this idea that there's a very special RNA, a single RNA from the second X chromosome that's responsible for this female bias. And that uh, RNA is called EXIST, which is the master regulator of X chromosome inactivation. So as I explained, uh, males have an X and a Y chromosome. Uh, the Y chromosome, by the way, is tiny. Uh, the X chromosome, women have two X chromosomes. And the system to make the gene expression output equivalent between the sexes is that in female cells, one of two X chromosomes will turn on a long non coding RNA gene called EXIST. EXIST is only transcribed from the second X chromosome, so it's randomly chosen. So it's only, therefore, female specific. And this RNA coats the chromosome from which it is expressed and silences gene expression uh, across the chromosome. The silencing is incomplete, and therefore there's some genes that escape X inactivation, causing differences between males and females. This is really a classic example of using RNA to control chromatin and exert a long-lasting effect. Because it exists not only silences gene expression in that cell, in fact, in every subsequent cell division, that choice is remembered, and the silencing continues throughout life of the woman. And so, for example, this is a beautiful calico cat. 
Uh, it's a girl because it's a, it's a calico. And these different patterns of, of color, these are clones of cells that have silenced a different version of the pigment gene uh, on the X chromosome. Okay, so you can actually, this is the original way of doing lineage tracing. Okay. And so how do we study this at a molecular level? So at the time when we were working on this, it was very challenging, laborious, to find the regulatory elements, the switches in the non-clean genome that's being controlled. And so my colleague and I, uh, were really, uh, at Stanford and I, developed this method called ATAC-seq, or assay of transposed accessible chromatin. So to explain briefly, in every human cell, two meters of DNA is packed into a 10 micron nucleus. And therefore, most of your DNA is highly compacted, not accessible, except for the active elements being read by the cell's machinery. Simply finding these accessible sites tells you the software program that the cell is actually running. So we realized that we can take this enzyme, a transposase, which is a bacterial enzyme that copies and pastes DNA. We load up this uh, uh, enzyme with DNA adapters used for sequencing and spray paint eukaryotic chromatin. Uh, for example, directly from a, 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 a human cell, a mouse cell. Uh, in that reaction, this enzyme can copy and paste into the open chromatin sites. And therefore, in a single step, you have selectively and covalently tagged the regions of interest, allowing you to amplify and sequence uh, the regions of uh, uh, the regulatory elements. So this method led to a pretty amazing, a million-fold improvement in the sensitivity and hundred-fold improvement in the speed of mapping regulatory elements. In the past, people used to grow up lots and lots of cells in the lab to study the chromatin state, and you're therefore studying copies of copies, but never the original. And this technology made it possible to directly study primary cell types, including patient material. So this is what the data will look like. So these are genomic tracks. On the x-axis are positions of genes. The y-axis of these peaks indicates the level of accessibility. So each of these will be an active regulatory element. The first row was the prior gold standard, DNA's hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity, which needed 10 million cells. This was the first version of a taxi, which only needed 50,000 cells. And a few years later, we succeeded in generating single cell ataxi data. You can tell that these tracks look virtually identical. But now when you zoom in, now there are 254 single cells here. Every row is one cell. At every position, you have either zero, either zero, one, or two reads because it's a diploid genome. So in this way, this kind of analog signal has turned into digital data. Now, coming back to X inactivation, if we compare the two X chromosomes in a female cell, the active X chromosome, called the XA, has all these regulatory elements. But the inactive X chromosome has globally lost accessibility they compacted uh, across the inactive X, except for the regions that escape X inactivation, which are now for the first time we know the elements driving the escape. On the top is basically now a, uh, a micrograph looking at what this would look like in C2. So on the red color is the exist RNA by RNA cytohybridization, and the green color is a version of attack where you can turn accessibility into a, a basically color. So more color, more accessible. I hope you can see then as I toggle back and forth that every place this exists RNA is, there's a black hole of accessibility, okay? And not only that, essentially the RNA has pulled uh, all this inactive exosomes into a, an edged nucleus, so-called bar body, and created this change in the 3D conformation. So it was long thought that exist RNA would work with protein partners, uh, but the, the partners were not known until, and so we developed a method, an RNA-directed proteomic approach to retrieve the endogenous partners. And this revealed that exist associates with a very long RNA, 19 kb long, associates with 81 proteins, 10 through direct RNA-protein interactions, and the other ones through indirect protein-protein interactions. And this set of proteins really gave a parts list for how it exists, spreads across the chromosome, uh, compacts the DNA, and silences gene expression. I'll just tell you about one key point, and that is that um, um, we have 81 proteins, so how do we figure out what's the most important? Well, importantly, prior work by Anton Lewis have re revealed that there's a small region of exists called the A repeat that was needed for gene silencing. So the A repeat deletion, you just chop up a few, few hundred nucleotides, it's still made, it still spreads across the whole X chromosome, but cannot shut down gene expression. So repeating the CHIRP-MS procedure for both full-length exists versus the A-repeat deletion, 
This is the uh, scatter plot, the peptide counts or retreat. You see that anything, everything is on the uh, 45 degree diagonal except three proteins whose protein count falls to zero. That tells you that these three proteins uh, require the A repeat uh, for binding. And moreover, this really showed that exist RNA is a modular scaffold, right? Different parts, different parts of the RNA bind to different proteins. We can individually test these proteins and reveal that this protein span was a key factor that's needed for silencing inactive X chromosome. This is a protein that was previously never been implicated before, and it acts by DNA deacetylation, a chromatin deacetylation. To summarize what we learned then is that the exist RNA is both a guide and a scaffold. It is a guide because the chromosome from which it is transcribed is not marked by this RNA and says this is the chromosome to shut down. The RNA is also a scaffold because it assembles a series of proteins, a series of enzymes. So it's like a train delivering passengers and cargoes. And so this RNA will basically give a molecular recipe of the biochemical reactions to be per performed on the chromatin template, right? And in order, uh, you can, this RNA will deliver the enzymes, and then in this, in X inactivation, uh, SPEN for, performs the first step to deactivate a previously active chromosome, turning this histomodification into an inactive one, and a second part of the uh, RNA protein complex involving the polycompressive complex that memorizes information for subsequent <coughs> cell divisions. So there's, there's a division of labor uh, for how uh, this complex epigenetic regulation is done. We've learned a couple of really interesting stories as well about the evolution of X inactivation. When we knocked out SPEN, indeed, as we predicted, X inactivation could not happen. But we found that actually many loci on autosomes, so other chromosomes, also gained accessibility. And almost half of these elements correspond to a class of endogenous retroviruses called Earth K. Okay? This was very interesting because I told you about the A repeat. And when we examined the A repeat, it turned out that A repeat has sequence similarities to these viral derived sequences. Again, herb sequences. This is the uh, sequence alignment, this is the secondary structure. So this told us that SPEN is in fact an ancient antiviral system. It surveys the genomes looking for viruses, and if the virus escapes and starts making RNA, that's a sign that you have a problem. So SPEN comes, finds those spots, and shuts down gene expression again. So the connection to X inactivation is that in other species, for example, bir for example birds, exist is an excellent protein coding gene. But what happens in mammals is that these ancient viruses jump into the exist locus. And the presence of the AVP endowed this RNA now with the ability to recruit SPEN. Okay? And then we believe this got amplified and led to the current system. And so this led us to the conclusion that X inactivation happens by a process of viral mimicry. And that is that exists as a device to make female cells think that the X chromosome has a raging viral infection. Then you can mobilize a very powerful antiviral epigenetic system to shut it down uh, and accomplishing the goal of dosage compensation for development. So you may think about this as like the original sin uh, of the system, and uh, what I have to talk about next. Uh, I told you that uh, X inactivation happens, but this actually, uh, this initiation happens early in development, during the in embryonic stem cells, in the blastocyst stage. But in fact, I also told you that this memory lasts throughout life. And in later we stud uh, studies, we found that in fact, in adult somatic cells, exists continues its job to maintain the inactive X. And so in B cells, in myeloid cells, exist RNA interacts with additional protein factors to maintain the cytogen gene expression. And for example, in B cells, we learn that we need the ongoing role of exist to prevent the ectopic activation of toll-like receptor 7. TR7 is another excellent gene. It encodes a receptor that senses RNAs. In the absence of uh, exist action, you have bilateral expression of TR7 in female B cells, which is a frequent feature we see uh, in autoimmune disease, but also other kinds of diseases. And this relates to being part of this enhanced immunity that we can see sometimes uh, in, in, in females. But our latest twist in this story really came from an unexpected direction. And so this came because I told you that I'm a physician scientist. And so 
In the U.S., there's a system that uh, every 10 years, you actually have to renew your board certification by taking tests. And so I was studying for such a test, and in fact, memorizing autoantibodies that are used to diagnose patients uh, with autoimmune diseases. And I realized that the list I was studying at night were mentioning some of the same proteins that I was studying during the day in my molecular biology lab. And I realized that, in fact, a number of the top exist associated proteins were actually autoantigens. So you can see on this heat map here, uh, these are the exist associated proteins in, in green, and, 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 and across here in the red, these are different autoantigens across different diseases. So this really led to a different hypothesis that perhaps the exist RNA protein complex is a female specific source of autoantigens that, if leaked out of dead and dying cells, can, tr adapt, can trigger adaptive immunity. And the idea is that these large nucleic acid protein complexes could perhaps have multiple uh, presence of epitopes, so these are features seen by the immune system, polymers that would activate and trigger immune cells. Many of you may know that there's a syndrome called Crest syndrome defined by autoantibodies to the centromere. Okay, so that's the same explanation. But if you think that a, a centromere is a big polymer, how about a whole RNA coding an entire chromosome, right? So it exists within that category. So we thought this was an interesting idea, but how do you test it? And so we thought the most uh, convincing experiment we could do was to make a male mouse express exist. And if that confers female level autoimmunity, that would mean that you do not need uh, female hormones. You don't even need the second X chromosome. Just the RNA protein complex would be enough to confer this disease. So that was easier said than done because if you express exist from any chromosome, it will silence gene expression across that chromosome, so that would be a cell lethal event in a diploid male cell. Okay, so this took us a while to figure out how to, how to solve this problem, but I just told you earlier that if you have this A repeat deletion, you can actually assemble 78 out of the 81 proteins, uh, still coat the whole chromosome, and then uh, allow us to ask this question, uh, can we confer autoimmune disease? So we uh, teamed up with the lab of Anton Woods, the engineer, uh, this inducible transgene system can turn on this uh, eight repeat deletion of exist on chromosome 11 uh, on command. And then uh, uh, shown on the right, then you can see that if we, if we, uh, we can actually create a female level of, uh, of exist in these male transgenic mice. And now it's shown on the bottom right, inside the RNA hybridization, create this essentially a fake bar body, right? Again, so they exist in RNAs now in these foci, but now on chromosome 11 rather than on the X chromosome. Next, we actually need a system, and so we turn to a mouse model of lupus called the pristine induced model. Pristine is a chemical, it, a single injection causes inflammation and tissue damage. Uh, and then will cause, uh, as you can see in this survival curve here, a predominantly female bias lupus-like disease uh, over males. Uh, this requires a specific genetic background, so I'll tell you about that in, in a moment. Uh, and so there will be many mice, uh, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, we'll just focus on the, uh, the following. They're all color-coded. So the female mice, positive control, they get the disease. The male mice, which is the negative control, they don't have a severe disease. And in the test case, uh, which is the male mice expressing exist. Do they get uh, worse disease? So we first noticed that uh, exist indu uh, induction uh, induces some, but not all auto autoantibodies uh, in males. So uh, shown, for example, here. And this, is, and this also has evidence of complement activation. So that says that perhaps there's a sign of autoimmune disease. But more importantly, if we actually examined the tissues uh, in question, we saw that exists uh, RNA expression in the, with this Pristain model really caused a multi-organ disease, in fact, in the kidney, the liver, lungs, and spleen. So this is some of the histology highlighting either areas of necrosis or evacuation. And you can see uh, summarized on this pathology score on the right, 100% of the female individuals have this very severe level of disease. Uh, uh, none of the male mice get to that level. If you express exist, then the majority of the male animals now have female level severity. Uh, of disease, really showing that exists confers autoimmune disease uh, to male mice. At the molecular level, uh, we started studying the adaptive immune system, T and B cells, 
And we can see that uh, if we're looking at uh, CD4 cells, looking at, again, the chromatin accessibility, we can define patterns of differences that can contrast between males and female individuals and exist expressions able to confer, uh, convert some of the uh, individuals to have a more female-like pattern. And this female-like pattern really reflects a changes in cell type, and that is that uh, male cells tend to have a larger fraction of naive CD4 T cells, uh, whereas there's more memory T cells uh, in the female mice, and this is what we confer with exist expression. So then uh, this is uh, correlated also with higher expression of certain uh, uh, genes on the RNA level, including another toll-like receptor, toll-like receptor now. We, want, we went on to conduct very systematic analysis of single cell RNA and chromatin accessibility, and this analysis really showed that there's a class of cells called atypical B cells that are the most expanded by axis expression. Uh, atypical B cells are, as this is the data here, so it's very high in female individuals and also in exist transgenic males uh, with a uh, high level of disease. So atypical B cells are interesting because this is a class of cells that are activated uh, by toll-like receptor signaling. And I just told you that, again, toll-like receptor 7 is on the X chromosome and actually directly senses RNA. So it might be directly sensing exists. Moreover, atypical B cells are known to expand uh, in aged mice, but only in female aged mice. So this is unexpected connection suggests that we're perhaps on the right track and that these, uh, uh, these cells are really perhaps uh, responsible or, or responding to exist activation. Okay, and finally I wanna talk about how we can return this science to patients. And so um, I showed you a number of mouse studies and I really wonder if this, is this also happening in patients that actually have autoimmune disease. And so I want you to kind of ask about uh, maybe really the screening test, which is the anti-nuclear antibody test. How many people here have heard of an ANA or actually ordered it? Please raise your hand. Okay, so I think everybody in, in medical, you probably learned about medical school that uh, what, uh, this is the, really the this, this starting test. And what you do is you take blood from patients, uh, you uh, react it with uh, um, cells, and you see what lights up, right? And these different patterns tell you what kind of diseases you might have, and you go on to the diagnosis. And so, in fact, in the past, uh, people have noticed that their autoimmune sera, that would stain the inactive X chromosome, right? So in this study, uh, back published in uh, 2001, these individuals found that if you stain, uh, these are male fibroblasts, female fibroblasts, notice how they light up with the bar body. If you have, uh, another interesting thing is that if you have more than, uh, Three X, more than two X chromosomes. All the extra X chromosomes are also getting silenced. So now in this is two bar bodies, right? So this is a really interesting case. So this was great, okay? But um, the, the literature kind of goes cold at this point. There are like very few follow-up studies. And I got very concerned because maybe what I found in mice was a very rare situation that never happens in patients. So maybe this is like a dead end. But then I learned something else that again changed my perspective. And that is that we have a serious problem with the anti-nuclear antibody testing. So this is a little history of, about how ANA was done. So first introduced in 1948, and different hospital, different doctors would do it on different kind of tissues. In 1975, an international standard was created, and for whatever reason, a male cell line was chosen as the standard for doing ANA. Okay, so what I just explained to you, Male cells will have no exist, and so every year, millions of patients around the world get this test, but they will never see this exist pattern. You know, I think this is really a missed opportunity, and that um, I told you at the beginning that the vast majority of our patients are actually female, and so we should perhaps think about uh, studying the disease process using models that reflect the biology of our patients. And in fact, the story gets a little worse because the standardization didn't quite work out because later on people found out that uh, some of these cells got contaminated with HeLa cells, which grow very well. And so the bottom line is that if you want to study sex-specific biology, and you're not sure about the sex of your cell lines you're working with, we have a, a real problem. Okay, so here we are in 2024, so we can fix this problem. So to that end, we, uh, our team, developed it exists antigen array, so basically every single protein in the exist complex in a recombinant purified form. So then we can then uh, test uh, antibodies, um, uh, a sera from patients 
uh, from our clinical collaborators uh, against uh, these proteins for reactivity. As you can see on this volcano plot on the right, really a number of the existing associated proteins uh, actually doc you know, demonstrate autoantibodies uh, in patients with female biased autoimmune diseases. And these patterns are able to actually distinguish different types of autoimmune diseases, including scleroderma, dermatomyositis, uh, and lupus. And uh, so I think this is really connects then uh, the, uh, the, the findings in the mouse model to also uh, autoantibodies in patients. And finally, uh, this is somewhat correlative uh, in what I just showed you. So the question is, how do you really know this is caused by the RNA? And so in this experiment, we come back to our mouse model, where we can actually look at the, uh, these sort of autoantibodies to exist pr uh, protein. Every row is a different protein in the exist complex. Every column is a sample. These are the autoantibodies in lupus. Now, in female mice, uh, they have much higher autoantibody levels to exist RNP, if we ex uh, much higher than uh, males. But if we express exist RNA in females, now we have basically increased the autoantibody levels to the level that's seen uh, in female individuals. So this really proves that exist RNA can induce autoantibodies to its own RNA protein complex. Right? All these proteins are expressed equally in males and females, but this RNA scaffold makes it into the energetic form. So the summary, I've told you that uh, this new model of female biased autoimmune disease that exists RNA is really this uh, sort of female uh, specific and unique dominant RNA. Every cell in the female's body expresses exists, and therefore there's this potential for this uh, possibility. Um, we learn also that with respect to genetic susceptibility, that in the uh, non permissive genetic background, individuals get T and B cell chromatin changes, but it stops and never progresses. But in the permissive genetic background, they can go out to have autoantibodies and progress onto cycles of tissue damage, antigen release, uh, and organ damage, and finally fall below autoimmunity. And so I believe that these models and studies give us opportunities to improve patient diagnosis uh, and therapy, and hopefully highlights the really amazing journey from basic science, understanding of gene regulation, uh, hopefully to disease. I want to thank many people involved in this work, principally, uh, especially Diana Du and Bing Fei Yu, who led the work that I told you about, my colleague, Will Greenleaf, uh, co mentor of a taxi, my funding sources, and thank you so much for your attention. Years ago, we identified a uh, Mendelian form of a cell caused by DNA 103 deficiency. Yes. And it's fascinating because it, it, it's in full agreement with your model. These patients, there's zero difference between males and females because the exposure is so high. Everybody gets this elite, right. whether male or female. What you're saying is you have this level of predisposition because of this exist RMP a trigger of autoantibody formation um, to a certain level. But beyond that, there's no difference between males and females. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you for that comment. So in fact, um, this is a perfect comment because I showed that figure of the difference in chromatin accessibility between active X chromosome and inactive X chromosome. We find that if we basically, uh, if we abuse our cells and culture and just make cells die and they release DNA fragments, you get much bigger fragments from the inactive X chromosome than from the active X chromosome. So the ataxy is basically essentially a, a, a proxy for how DNA should chop up uh, basically pieces of chromatin, right? And so you're finding with the DNA's uh, 1,3-L deficiencies really, really nears that point. So if you can't chop up any DNA, right, that, that male or female will be the same. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I use both the females and the boys so, uh, I'm intrigued by uh, the turning on of turn on seven, turn on like seven, by exist in the, in the, in the excitation process. At the same time, turn on seven says, you know, as you said, the viral RNA. Do you think that will explain the, uh, the emergence of autoimmune diseases probably after some viral infections or probably even viral vaccines? Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. So um, I think that, uh, right, so just to be clear, so exists, I think, is one of the factors making sure that the toll like receptor 7 gene from the second copy, right, on the inactive X does not uh, basically get expressed. 
but yeah, I, I think that the fact that there's in fact a recent study showing that the, a piece of exist RNA itself can trigger toll-like receptor 7 signaling. Right? So I think that, and that comes back to, again to the, the, the viral origin of exist, uh, the business ends. Uh, that I talked about, this uh, viral mimicry. But definitely, I think that uh, this is a very interesting connection then to um, nucleic acid mediated, uh, sometimes good or bad, but either vaccination response, more potent, uh, or then perhaps, unfortunately, sometimes uh, going into autoimmune disease. Right, this is a great question. So we're really interested in understanding the process from which the exist uh, RNA and RNP and how they lead to autoimmunity. And we think there are at least two points. One is that how does the exist RNA and protein complex come out of dead and dying cells? Everything we've done in the past, and I would say the field, has focused on regulatory RNAs in its native context in C2. But these large nucleic acid protein complex, when they leave the cell, may have an afterlife that is really worthy of study. That's one first point. The second point is that we identify these atypical B cells as really uh, the cells that respond uh, to, for example, exist. And so whether targeting those cells uh, will be uh, beneficial is something that remains to be seen. Yeah, great question. So I think that, uh, uh, in fact, there's a lot of interest in reactivation of endogenous retroviruses, except, for example, line L1 and so forth, both in aging and also uh, actually as an evidence in cancer. So people have found that like uh, antibodies to uh, L1 uh, or, for example, uh, is very uh, correlated uh, with the presence of cancer. And so I think both are, uh, these are very worthy topics of study.